Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on vendor privacy assessments. My name is Sergio Velarde, and I'm a senior associate at Fieldfisher, uh, and I'm based out of the firm Silicon Valley office in the U.S., where I focus on privacy and data protection matters. Today, I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Felicity Fisher and Andrea Ortega. Cool. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks very much for coming to join us today. Um, to give you a little bit of uh, an overview of what we're going to chat about today, um, I appreciate we gave you this very um, exciting title, which kind of mentions that we would be going into things like red flags and data transfer um, impact assessments. And we are definitely going to be covering those today. Uh, but we wanted to flag that this is actually going to be the first episode in what we're going to be doing as a mini series on vendor privacy assessments. So we realize this is a really kind of uh, big topic and there are lots of interesting aspects of this that kind of merit separate webinars to dig into some of the details. So for the purposes of today's webinar, we're really going to focus on where some of these obligations to do these privacy risk assessments come from, as in risk assessments of your third party vendors. Um, and then we're going to provide some tips on how you can go about practically approaching some of those assessments assessments. Um, I think if you look at some of the statistics that are out there, many uh, companies have a vast number of vendors. Um, you know, I think the average is somewhere over 700 vendors. So this remains kind of keeping on track of your vendors and making sure that you're completing these assessments remains a massive compliance challenge for uh, many organizations, including the clients that we work with. So um, going to be an interesting topic to tackle. So, um, but, so we'll, we'll cover sort of the how and why of, of the assessments today. Um, and then you can look forward to episode two and three in our mini series, where we're going to dig a little bit deeper into how to actually quantify some of those risks um, and, how, um, and what some of those risks uh, are. So that, that second episode is really going to be a bit more of a deep, deeper dive into the specific risks that you should be uh, looking at and, and how to kind of weight that in your risk assessment. And then finally, episode three, we're going to look at how uh, you can negotiate uh, well, the process of negotiating those contracts with those vendors and some of the liability considerations. And so by episode three, we hope to have given you a, a more complete understanding of some of the key uh, you know, issues to think through, both from an assessment perspective and a contracting perspective. So back over to you, Sergio. Thank you, Fleck. Um, and I think we can start off by understanding where our privacy third party risk and due diligence obligations come from. Uh, understanding these will uh, help us understand when and what needs to be done. Um, and at a high level, these come from these three categories. You have uh, data privacy regulations, whether it's the GDPR, CCPA, the upcoming CPRA uh, commitments, and consumer protection and InfoSec laws. Uh, on the first point, you know, we're increasingly getting new regulations, new laws every couple months. And while the details vary on the applicable data privacy law, generally speaking, all major data privacy regulations globally have legal requirements that place an obligation on businesses to process data uh, according to certain standards, but also to ensure that third parties also protect the data in accordance with similar standards. On the commitment side, these are commitments made either to your business partners, your customers, or to some certification body or some such organization like Privacy Shield, for example. And these commitments are slightly different from the law as such because these are basically additional promises you've made. Uh, which is why it's important to standardize the commitments uh, early on and align them with legal requirements. Uh, I think it's very common, particularly for young businesses, to agree to ad hoc and very tailored commitments to land big customers. And the problem with this approach is that it makes it difficult to track what you committed to and how you should be uh, assessing third parties, which opens up risk. Uh, third, um, it's also worth mentioning that best practices, even outside of the context of data privacy, 
uh, require you to pay attention to your third parties. Just given general requirements and consumer protection laws and infosec laws, all of which are increasingly concerned with how people's personal data is handled. So now that we have uh, an idea of the many sources of our obligations, um, you know, how do we proceed with our vendor assessment? Um, or first, we classify the vendor. Yeah, and um, we kind of thought it'd be really useful to just quickly dig into this particular issue. It comes up a lot that we get kind of clients asking us, you know, is the vendor a data processor or are they a sub processor or are they a controller? So kind of figuring out or working out how to categorize the vendor based on the data controller or data processor categorization that the GDPR follows is sometimes something that uh, presents an initial challenge for people. So we thought it'd be useful just to kind of give you some a steer on some of the things you need to think about. So back to some basics, obviously a data controller is the entity that determines how and why the data uh, is processed. So they are the decision maker when it comes to the data processing. Whereas a data processor is only ever allowed to process the data on the documented instructions of the data controller. Um, and actually um, it's important to note that the GDPR does not itself define what a subprocessor is. It's not a concept that's reflected in the GDPR. Instead, we're talking about uh, a subprocessor would effectively be another data processor in the chain. So you should think about a subprocessor as a, essentially a processor that is processing data on behalf of another processor. Um, so that's how that would typically work. So if you apply this to a typical kind of procurement scenario, uh, the data controller may be the customer and then it may be engaging a vendor to act as a data process. And that would usually happen if, for example, you, um, so you are engaging an HR or a marketing vendor to process your data. That would usually involve a data controller to data process a relationship. And that is because if you are the customer, you are, the data controller of your HR or marketing data. However, if you are engaging a vendor to help you process your customer data, for example, um, and you are yourself a data processor of that customer data, then that uh, th third party vendor would be acting as your sub processor, um, i.e. a fourth party processor. So whenever you're looking at your vendor and thinking, how do I classify them? You really need to think about the role that you're playing uh, with respect to the data that you're going to be sharing or entrusting that third party with. So if you are yourself a data controller of the information, the third party will be a data processor. Whereas if you are yourself a processor acting on behalf of a third party controller or another processor, then that third party would be a sub processor. And that distinction is relevant because, as you'll see from this slide, it really plays into some of the, uh, the scope of your obligations that you're going to have in terms of completing those risk assessments. Because the GDPR very much divides up your compliance obligations depending on whether you're acting as a controller or processor. Um, as a very kind of general principle, it's the controllers that ultimately are responsible for all of the third party processes in the chain, um, including ensuring that the, the processing that is done through the chain complies with the core principles of the GDPR. Um, and specifically, a controller is responsible for ensuring that each processor can provide sufficient guarantees to protect the privacy and security of the data. Um, and so, that in practice translates into an obligation to do um, appropriate risk assessments of the data processes that a controller is engaging and also having some regard for you know, other processing that might be going on down the chain. When you look to what a processor's obligation is, most of the obligations that a processor has are rooted in the contract that it agrees to with the controller. Because remember, a controller and processor must enter into a Article 28 compliant contract referred to most commonly as a data processing agreement. And under that data processing agreement, the processor is contractually required to agree that it will ensure all of its further processes or sub 
processes contract on the same terms including ensuring that each of those sub-processes is also able to provide sufficient guarantees, again, to protect the privacy and security of the data. And importantly, the processor also agrees to be liable to the controller for the performance of its sub-processes. And so we can see that the GDPR effectively forces a chaining of responsibility for each of the processes in the chain, but ultimately it's the original controller that bears the primary responsibility for ensuring everybody in that chain uh, is able to you know process the data in compliance with the gdpr um, and so that kind of reinforces the need for each party in the chain to be making sure that it has carried out an appropriate risk assessment of each of the third party processes that it's engaging to again make sure that they're able to offer those sufficient compliance guarantees. Um, other relevant things just to bear in mind are if you're a controller, you also uh, have this obligation to perform data privacy impact assessments, DPIAs, if your processing is likely to be high risk. And um, if you are engaging any high risk processing, you might need to involve your vendor in helping you complete those risk assessments if they're going to be uh, key and, and involved in that high risk processing activity. And then finally, just a reminder that controllers have this ultimate accountability obligation, which is that they must be able to demonstrate that the processing is performed in compliance with the GDPR. Again, all kind of reinforcing the point that you need to have some documented evidence that you've done appropriate due diligence on your processes um, uh, to, to you know, ensure that you're evidencing you've complied with that Article 28.1 obligation, amongst other things. Um, so, what other uh, obligations do we need to be aware of? Um, and then the key one, and Andrew's now going to talk about this, is also this need to do transfer impact assessments. So, over to you, Andrea. Yeah, thanks, Flick, and hi, everyone. So with regards specifically to data transfers, besides the GDPR, the strength to judgment and the new standard contractual clauses now also require that the protection granted to personal data in Europe also travels with the data wherever it goes. And therefore data exporters are required to conduct a transfer impact assessment to verify on a case by case basis and in collaboration with the data importer, if the laws or practices of the third country impinge on the effectiveness of the transfer tool and whether supplementary measures are needed to fill in the gaps in the protection and bring it up to the level required by EU law. So when mapping transfers, uh, do not forget to take into account onward transfers. So for instance, those cases where the vendor is transferring data to its sub-processors. This TI requirement therefore covers all the processing chain. It also covers controller to controller transfers, which means that even if the GDPR does not explicitly require vendor due diligence for C2C relationships, GDPR principles, data transfer considerations and commercial considerations are still important. And when drawing the conclusion as a data exporter, Note that a risk-based assessment is permitted, meaning that you can, for instance, take into account the experience of the data importer dealing with government access requests or other of, or of other actors operating within the same sector, for example. You can also conduct a more in-depth assessment for high-risk transfers or high-risk vendors and take a lighter touch approach for lower risk transfers. Besides this, I also wanted to highlight that some recent decisions, including the Google Analytics decision, which was discussed in one of our previous webinars, are calling out the importance of this TI assessment and remind us that the parties might, must identify and track their data exports. They must have SCCs or another lawful transfer mechanism in place, and they must also evaluate and document the risks of transfers and any additional safeguards. So coming back to the vendor risk assessment, I think the first step will be to understand to which countries and territories the organization is transferring the data. And for that, you will likely need, in this case, the input from, uh, so from the vendors as importers of where they're going to process the data. And note also that when we refer to processing, this includes also remote access, so not just where they're storing the data. Once you have this initial information, you'll be able to determine whether a TIA, a full TIA is needed. 
And now I'm going to hand it over to Sergio, who's going to give a high-level overview of the vendor risk assessment process. Thank you, Andrea. And, um, I think to really illustrate the changes that TIAs bring to your organization, it's useful to go over how things work typically in a vendor management process uh, versus the updates and the impact that TIA, TIAs will have on these. Um, so typically, how things work in many businesses is you'll have a process of set up a sim similar to what you're seeing on the screen. Um, you may recognize some of these steps with any organization. If you don't, don't feel too bad because uh, to many, this is an ongoing project and setting up all these pieces takes time. So how it works is typically a particular corporate function, like your marketing, whatever, will request a particular vendor to be used to achieve a goal of hers. So first step is uh, to identify the prospective vendor, assess whether they're processing personal data, and if so, kick off the specific privacy review process. Um, after that, perhaps the vendor will sign an NDA and then proceed to complete a due diligence questionnaire, which uh, should have some of the considerations we'll discuss next. Um, from there, you want to complete a risk assessment and then address any identified risks. Uh, from there, assuming everything is up to your organization standards, you sign a deal and then hopefully enter the vendor and the data they're processing into your data processing records. Um, after that, maybe you do some post-contract due diligence as needed. Um, this is a high-level view of how things are now. Now, if we zoom in on four, on complete risk assessment, um, the question is, well, what does that look like and what's something to consider? Yeah, so a complete risk assessment, so now focusing on, on step four, is a complex tax and uh, proportionality is key. So the higher the risk the processing presents, the greater the checks and controls you should have in place. And this means a risk-based approach based on the type of vendor and the type of processor is recommended. Some key factors in assessing risk include the ones that are listed in the slides. So the categories of personal data, the categories of data subjects, the volume of data, for what purposes will the vendor process the data, in which role or roles is the vendor processing the data, from which locations, which controls and security measures are in place to protect the data, is the vendor using subprocessors? Are they training staff on handling personal data? And also, for instance, whether they're prepared for a security, security incident and for data subject requests, among other things. So the more the organization knows as a starting point about the types of vendors, the types of transfers and so forth, the more it can streamline the due diligence exercise. With this, I mean that, for instance, if the organization is able to pre-categorize vendors from low to high risk vendors. So, for example, say you'll have some categories of vendors that could that provide marketing services. Others are like HR vendors, which can also be subcategorized between those that process special categories of data and those that do not, for instance. This type of categorization and pre-assessment can help really streamline the process. And as a general indication, due to the nature of their services, for instance, SaaS providers processing large amounts of customer data or payment processors, marketing services, tracking services, are likely to, um, uh, to, to have or to be high risk. And high risk vendors will, re will require a more in-depth assessment than low risk vendors. So for instance, they'll require conducting a DPI, as Flick was mentioning earlier. There's not a, an exact science for this, and each organization, organization will have to weigh uh, different risks and different organization objectives. We'll go into more detail about how to assess vendor risk in the next webinar, but here's an example of how you could start doing, doing this um, categorization and, and, this, uh, and assigning these levels of risk. And what we're really saying is if you kind of have a, a preset weighted risk assessment, i.e. criteria that you would apply uh, to, uh, you know, put each vendor in the medium, high or, or low risk category, then what you can do is once you, you can decide as an organization that if this vendor, for example, falls into the low risk category, we might do a, a kind of more minimal amount of due diligence on them. So we would just make sure that we understand what security measures they have in place. Um, you know, it might be that we're, we're confident that if they can demonstrate their ISO 27001 certified um, and they 
check you know some basic boxes around how their um you know the security policies they have in place we can move it move on given they're a low risk vendor but you may for example for at the very least for your higher risk vendors take them through as andrew said a more detailed privacy impact assessment uh, to make sure that you've done a much more thorough review given the potential exposure there uh, given the nature of the processing so it's really about effectively triaging the vendors we know that vendor privacy assessments can take a lot of resource and time and so you want to make sure that you're directing the most amount of time and resources on doing uh, you know making sure that those higher risk vendors are put through a more detailed assessment and as Andrea said this kind of slide is just a sort of illustrative example of how you might start to think through some of that um, risk um, cool I think we're gonna go to the next slide that's right and and I think that brings us to uh, basically how do TIAs really impact the process um, you know what what's what is it that changes now that we have this additional obligation on top of all the other obligations we had um, and I think if, if we can categorize the the process into these three components basically uh, you know the first would be you need to update your existing risk assessment to include TIA considerations um, and uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, I think I'm seeing quite a few of them. And I think one of them uh, points to this particular point um, about how is one to update these uh, assessments uh, going forward, given that uh, you're essentially relying on a third party's promises that they've conducted a TIA themselves uh, in order for you to conduct your own TIA. So, um, Flick, Andrea, what would you say, like, you've seen in this context be a, a useful way of proceeding, given that you're relying on a third party's promise that they've done something or they'll do something? Yeah, it's definitely a, um, a challenge there because, of course, if you are the controller of the data, then remember that you're, again, ultimately responsible for all of the kind of chain of processing that happens, including if you're the primary data exporter, kind of making sure that that um you know those tias being completed unfortunately there's again there's no kind of um silver bullet to this i think it all depends on your uh you know the allocation of risk that you assign to a particular vendor so if we think that they are maybe a lower risk vendor then we might be able to get a little bit more comfortable with the fact that we're relying on contractual um, assurances from our vendor that they have also gone and done those transfer impact assessments um, whereas if we think they are a higher risk or even a medium risk vendor then you may want to do a bit more due diligence to make sure that they are able to evidence that they've done those transfer impact assessments and of course if they are using vendors if you're able and you should be obtaining a list of the the vendors own sub processes then if those sub processing processes include some of those well-known sub processes like AWS um, or GCP or a number of others then there are in fact a, a number of those larger more established uh, vendors have published some form of information whether it be a customer facing transfer impact assessment or a transfer FAQ to help people conduct those transfer impact assessments so kind of doing some research to figure out if there is any publicly available information that you could include in your own assessment uh, that kind of maps to some of those vendors sub processes may be a kind of helpful way to document that you've at least got some information in your own due diligence to kind of factor in that third party transfer impact assessment um, but I appreciate it's a very, really challenging issue because it becomes a bit yeah. of a rabbit hole that you could end up getting lost in and frankly um, doing these transfer impact assessments is an enormous task if you have if you try to do it in full compliance with the expectations of the European Data Protection Board guidance um, we could be doing transfer impact assessments for years so there has to be some appropriate triaging I think um, and prioritization uh, so I think there's an initial exercise again yeah. to kind of do that risk assessment of the vendor 
And when it comes to transfer impact assessments, again, some of the other webinars are going to go into a little bit more detail about this, but the risk assessment might be slightly different. So uh, you might focus a little bit more on the countries in which the data is going to be processed and assign different risk scores depending on, the, uh, on those um, countries. So we know based on the Schwimm's yeah. two decision that processing in the US carries a high risk based on uh, the um, scope of the US surveillance laws so that you might be starting off with that kind of assessment that the laws in the country present a higher risk. So we need to go and do a little bit more digging. Um, yeah, so that might be one way to do I it. I think that's right. Yeah. And I mean, I think that, you know, given that the, the the short answer but i think is basically yes it's a lot and if you need to if you want to truly comply with the law and the requirements uh it's a ton of work uh and because of that you really need to um uh, narrow down where the risk lies because there's theoretical risk everywhere but then there's the actual risk um another question we had was uh whether incidental access to personal data if a vendor has only incidental access to personal data, do these provisions, uh, are they necessary? And um, I think, you know, that would go, yes, even incidental access to personal data, I think would be, uh, would require all these, all these things to be done, but that would also go into your uh, overall uh, prioritization of perhaps you want to focus on your vendors that handle um, a lot of personal data or very particularly sensitive data and then you know those that have incidental or minimal access to it that's something that uh, you should do a review on and and all that but you want to you want to preserve your resources for where the actual risk lies rather than just the theoretical risk yeah and i think just in terms of you know if it's incidental access you know technically yeah we need we need to be treating that as something that needs to be reviewed by a tia but you probably at this point to sergio's point you may it may justify doing a tia tia light version i.e you know perhaps you you're able to look online and see if they've got some information about their own you know assessments that they've carried out uh, or you could frame a, a slightly lighter questionnaire just to get some basic information and move on I think that's the reality of how people yeah. are having to triage this. That's right. And um, another question we had is, you know, basically vendors that you may be using, like insurance and healthcare providers, the question is, wouldn't they be controllers rather than processors? And maybe the some of these review considerations are more limited. And I think that goes back to our original point that that first step where you're um, categorizing the vendors is really important. Um, and just to review, you know, whether those vendors are acting as controllers or processors, uh, insurance companies or healthcare providers, um, or any others really would just determine on the facts of the situation, like what sort of, are they processing the data on your behalf? Um, yeah, or no, think, are they doing so? Uh, yeah, and I think, I think that, to, I think that the, the and I'm not sure who raised the question, but it is a very good question because you're right. If you are contracting with a with a controller on a controller to controller basis, the GDPR says less about the types of assessments or contracts that you have to have in place with those third party controllers. It's essentially left to the parties to agree appropriate terms. That said, um, any controller you know, if, if you're the main controller sharing the data, you've still got to have regard to the basic principles of the GDPR, um, including making sure that you have a lawful basis to share the data with that other controller and being cognizant of your obligations to protect the data with appropriate security measures. So that all means that you need to make sure that, that you're doing some level of assessment to make sure that when you're sharing the data with that other controller, uh, that you're going to be, that they're going to be able to protect it almost as part of being able to to, you know, it will go into your assessment of the legal grounds that you might be able to rely on to share the data as well. The other thing is, although the GDPR yeah. is silent on the terms that you have to have in place when you share data with an independent controller, it does uh, mandate that there has to be an arrangement if you're sharing it with a joint controller. And it also mandates that if that sharing involves a data export, i.e. the data is being shared with a controller in a third country, a non-adequate country, then you need to have, you know, module one 
one of the standard contractual clauses in place, which, and in addition, that will necessitate that you do a transfer impact assessment. So you might not need to do the all singing, all dancing vendor uh, assessment that you do when you're engaging processes, but you will need to do a trans, you know, transfer impact assessment yeah. when you're sharing it with that other controller. That's right. And I mean, um, and I think uh, on our third point here, once you reach the vendor conclusion, and we have a question directly on this as well, you know, what if we come to the conclusion that the vendor is not adequate? And, you know, we, we've looked into supplementary measures uh, that need to be used uh, in order to continue to or start using the vendor. Um, and what if we still don't find it adequate? Um, what do we do? Well, the law would say that you can't use that vendor if you come to the conclusion that they're not a, they don't offer an adequate level of protection. Um, but again, I think, you know, usually legal and compliance don't make the decisions when it comes to a particularly necessary vendor. So again, this would be a question of how much risk you want to take on, uh, given that the law says that no adequacy means no transfers. Yeah. And That's I right. Think, yeah. And I think you've also got to be very careful then when you do those transfer impact assessments, because you could end up boxing yourself in a corner. I mean, if you've, if you've documented a transfer impact assessment that comes to the conclusion that there are no, for example, supplementary measures that this vendor is able to offer that's going to bring the compliance up to an adequate standard, uh, then you've docu you're documenting some, some serious non-compliance there if you then continue to go on and use the vendor. So, it's uh, there's a little bit of a you know you've got to be quite careful about some of the conclusions that you're coming to in these TIAs, um, and I, I don't mean that I'm not suggesting that you kind of create a great work of fiction there, uh, but they there does need to be um, you know you do need to be careful if you've documented something isn't isn't adequate, um, that's going to create some real potential risk there if you then go on to use the vendor. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I think that is all for today. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, hopefully this was helpful. Uh, as a reminder, during our next webinar, we'll be doing a more in-depth view of the com most common risks and, and basically what you really should be focusing on uh, now that you have a good overview of uh, the sources of your obligations, where um, how to the, the notion of triaging and prioritizing and that if you want to um, comply with the law, you really need to uh, allocate your resources accordingly. Um, so look for that on March 9th. Uh, we'll see you all again. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks very much. Have a good day.